Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cyber criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Lauro Chavez. Hello and welcome to the Cyber Ants Podcast. This is your co-host Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Lauro Chavez. And today we are having a conversation about social engineering. Uh, some call it human hacking, um, manipulation of people to get into uh, their network environments, their sensitive data, and so on. So we'll dive into that topic. But before we do, Mike, you want to kick us off with the news? Yeah, and just, you know, to dovetail into that, here's a good headline for you. Proofpoint's Voice of the CISO 2021 report reveals two-thirds of global CISOs feel unprepared to cope with cyber attack. Uh, That should make you feel good. Uh, 66% of CISOs feel that organizations are unprepared to handle a cyber attack, and 58% consider human error to be the biggest cyber vulnerability, proving that the work-from-home model necessitated by the pandemic has tested CISOs like never before. So that kind of maybe dovetails into some pipeline that may have had a problem. Um, (laughs) Humans don't screw up. Never. It's the machine. It's always the machine. IT would be great if it wasn't for the users. So. (laughs) So easy. Yeah. Microsoft warns, watch out for this new data. According to Microsoft, there's the phishing emails distribute a loader that delivers a revenge rat or async rat. This campaign uses emails that spoof legitimate organization, which lures relevant aviation travel or cargo. Um, yesterday, they came out with a new executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. I started to read this and then fell asleep, hit my head, and forgot all about it. Um, it's about 10, 12 paragraphs long, uh, typical bureaucraties, but long story short, uh, the feds are going to get more involved with um, how we're going to do things from a cybersecurity perspective. I do ha- definitely recommend that you read it if you deal with the federal government in any way, shape, or form, especially um, if you're in the FARS or DFAR space. So, um, or, or if you have sleeping problems. Or if you have sleeping problems. Yes, it's great at 2 a.m. I fell asleep this morning again reading it, so it's great at 8 a.m. too. Microsoft Outlook bug prevents viewing or creating email worldwide. Um, we've identified the underlying cause of impact and are applying a fix, according to Microsoft. Um, <laughs> basically, you need to remit, restart your email client to apply the fix in some circumstances. Um, Microsoft just keeps having a bad, what, 20 years? Shining light on dark side ransomware operations, Mandy has identified multiple dark side victims out there. They're the ones that did the Colonial Pipeline. These guys have been around for a while, but they function mainly as a, as a ransomware for sale. So what they've got out there is available for anybody to use. So really tracking them down to who did what may not necessarily be dark side doing, they're just providing the service. So uh, something to keep in mind that, that that is still out there and there's some very serious people dealing, dealing with us. So this is a little scary. All Wi-Fi devices impacted by new frag attacks vulnerabilities. This basically includes every Wi-Fi device since 1997. So... Uh, there is, and that includes WPA3, um, but it's basically there's a flaw, design flaw in Wi-Fi 802.11 in the frame aggregation. So needless to say, every Wi-Fi device is potentially impacted by these new frag vulnerabilities. Look into it, though. It's pretty hard to exploit, uh, but it's something to be cognizant of, at least. Um, hacking Kerberos with AS Rep Roasting, and that's R-E-P, uh, Kerberos developed by MIT is a network authentication protocol that used in Active Directory, if you didn't know that, uh, runs on port 88. Um, and basically, there's a hack out there for it. Sorry, I didn't do enough research on that one to uh, explain it adequately. This one I like, app tracking apps plead for users to press allow, but 85% of Apple iOS custom consumers are not opting in. And good for you, 85% of Apple iOS consumers. Don't let them track you. Uh, basically, uh, uh, iOS 14.5 um, allows you to opt in or opt out of allowing apps to request you to be tracked. And so far, only 15% of people worldwide have done so. So um, and that's good news because there's far more, too much control over us from a tech perspective. And with that, that's all the headlines. So, Laurel, do you have anything? 
Yeah, I got a couple things from the exploitable space and cyberspace today, mainly talking about Epic Games again. So if you remember last week, we talked about the anti-cheat lo local privilege escalation. Now we've got another stack buffer overrun for Rocket League. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why are you messing with the games that we like to play? Why? I don't know. So if you've got kids out there playing Rocket League, um, make sure that you're, you've got them updated on the most current version. Typically, the games will make you update, but sometimes without an internet connection, you could be playing these games on a local area network. It could make you vulnerable to this um, to this type of, uh, of buffer overrun. Uh, but that's all we have today for exploits in the wild. Outstanding. Well, let's talk about social engineering. It's uh, one of those things that is very, very relevant because the human element is almost always the weakest link in a cybersecurity program. So it's important for the listeners to uh, understand the people building cybersecurity programs to really take this seriously. I think a lot of people take a kind of check the block approach, like, yeah, we did some training and, and check that block this year, uh, but really aren't, aren't as effective as they could be. And as a result, attacks occur. But first of all, let's talk about what it is. Uh, social engineering is the, uh, I, I, I don't, wouldn't like to call it manipulation so much, right? Because it can be good, used in, in a lot of good ways, right? People use um, social engineering basically to elicit response in different ways from different people, right? And so it could be um, a doctor or a psychologist working to get certain information out of a person. It could be a salesperson uh, through the sales process trying to collect information in order to hopefully help make the best decision for their client or prospect. So it can be used in ways like that, but it could also be used in harmful ways, right? And if we can pull on the emotions of people and get them to reveal information that they wouldn't otherwise, we can collect sensitive information that could be used for bad, for harm, right? And that's what cyber criminals do each and every day. We see probably the most, well, by far the most common is, of course, your phishing emails that come through, right? It's supposed to look like something that um, is legitimate, something that you would click on, your FedEx package is delayed, or your Office 365 username and password need to be changed. There was some problem, you know, that the IT team is telling you about, things like that are very, very common. So of course, I think most of us are familiar with phishing emails, it's common, but there's also vishing, right? So over the phone, essentially voice phishing, in a variety of other ways, even in person, social engineering happens constantly, right? So you, you, could, you could even take this back to um, different realms in the uh, government, right? And in, in, in the intelligence community with elicitations, with interrogation, that sort of thing, um, getting access and placement to places you couldn't have without it. So that's a high level overview. There are a lot of different definitions be, uh, depending on who you ask, what social engineering is, but in essence, just think of performing some sort of acts that get people to perform in a way that maybe they wouldn't naturally or wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise and reveal uh, information. So it's not good or bad, but today we're talking about it in the bad sense, right? From the cyber criminal perspective. So a couple things to watch out for, and then I will shut up, I promise. But familiarity is a big thing, right? They say, I, you know, I know so-and-so or so-and-so in IT told me to reach out, or they may act like they know something about the inner workings of the company. Maybe they're acting like a vendor, something like that. That's very, very common. Uh, urgency is another emotional string that they pull. We have to have the answer by tomorrow. We need this information quickly because the big boss is requiring it. Um, you know, authority, people taking over the position of a leader in an organization, maybe by spoofing their email, uh, for example, saying that they need certain information. Um, the, the list goes on and on. I won't go through all of them today, but those are some very, very common approaches that cyber criminals use to pull the emotional strings of their victims and collect sensitive information. So I hope that's a good overview. Mike, Laura, do you have anything to add about what it is, anything that I missed that you would like to cover before we dive into the rest of this? I think you got it all. End of podcast. 
Yeah, thanks and for doing all the talking, dude. That was great. <laughs> and we're out of time. Right. And we're out of time. <laughs> Want even more Cyber Rants? Be sure to subscribe to the Cyber Rants podcast. Get your copy of our best-selling book, Cyber Rants, on Amazon today. This podcast is brought to you by Silent Sector, a firm dedicated to building world-class cybersecurity programs for mid-market and emerging companies across the U.S. Silent Sector also provides industry-leading penetration tests and cyber risk assessments. Visit silentsector.com and contact us today. Well, that's great. We talked about what social engineering is. Now let's get into the meat of this. Why are we here? <laughs> the purpose is to help people understand, well, what do we do about it? We know it's out there. We know it's prevalent. The vast, vast majority of attacks happen because of some sort of social engineering manipulation, uh, especially through email, but certainly through other ways. I think to start off, you know, what's what's the obvious one uh, as far as preventing these attacks, right? Probably training, right? staff awareness. Man, just but, being grounded, you know, I mean, yeah, staff awareness is helpful. You know, things like know before are helpful, but my gosh, you know, just... I think if people like just take a moment longer to digest what's happening instead of kind of having that emotional reaction when they see the message, um, that would be, I think that would help everybody. And, and real quick, uh, let me talk about something real quick. So, you know, if you didn't know out there in the community, I am a very big target. Okay. I get smishing and vishing and email crap sent to me all the time. It never works. All right. And, and the reason it never works is because a, I'm expecting it and B I look at all the original, I show the original text in the email. I look at the email root of, you know, message so I can see where the sender is, where it came from, the MX record, the whole bit of it, right? And, and one thing I think is interesting that I've seen recently that I think is a, a pretty sophisticated approach to social engineering was on social media, Instagram. So we have to on Instagram, Facebook. Keep, keep in mind, okay, there was a, a little thing going around. It was like, hey fill this out and pass it on. And it was like your favorite color, your mom's maiden name, um, your maiden name before you were married, the street you grew up on. And I kind of looking at these and I had a friend of mine send it to me, you know, and, and yeah, I was following or whatever. So I showed up on my feed. It was like, Hey, complete this and send it back out to all your friends. When I started looking at those questions, they, they, they became very familiar to me. I was like, well, that's interesting. Those are the same types of questions that security questions typically are worded like, right? When you have security questions enabled for your bank or whatever, right? Um, as a method to verify who you are, right? That, 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 that identity factor. So they're using a very sophisticated form of social um, engineering, right? On social media. So it's, it's, it's like social engineering on social. Anyways, I like saying that. So um, be leery of that, okay? When you see these things come through from your friends and they're like, hey, fill out this stuff. And, you know, what's your favorite color? What was your pet's name? Right. What year were you married? That sort of thing. It's like to, to build like a little profile on you. It sounds like it's a fun game to play with your friends so that you kind of know each other more. I guarantee you cyber criminals are fronting this and they're taking all of that data back and they're profiling everybody. And so now they have you and they have all the, 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 the particulars about you, right? Your favorite colors, your pet's name, things that you might use for a security questionnaire. Um, and so uh, that's probably one of the more um, kind of camouflaged phishing campaigns that I've seen, social engineering campaigns I've seen come up in, in recent days. Yeah. That, that's, that's a big thing on Facebook thing. a long time ago too, though. I mean, it would be like, what, you know, what Star Trek character are you fill, fill out this quiz, right? Or what, you know, what's your personality traits fill out this quiz? And I think Facebook uses that as social engineering to develop profiles on people as well. Oh, so it's not, absolutely. It's not just absolutely. criminals that are doing it. It's also businesses that are doing it in order to develop you know, profiles to send you ads and, and, and provide that sort of thing to you um, in order to manipulate you or get you to buy certain products or just determine what ads get shaped to you as well. Um, and just to dovetail on what Laura said about you know, him being a target, anybody in cybersecurity right now um, is a target. And it started with, IT. Yeah, it started with Google's threat group um, that got hit up with, uh, you know, just some malicious stuff. And I think we talked about it in a news story a week or two ago. Uh, but yeah, anybody in cybersecurity is a target. So be very careful out there about answering that sort of thing and be careful what you're putting on your social media. So 
something. Totally. I get, work. I get text messages. It's like, Oh, Hey, Laura, I see that you're an author. You should, um, you should try to, uh, you know, write a book for us. And then they have a obscure link and a text message. <laughs> you know yeah, what I was right. like, I yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's a real simple way to deal with that. Don't click on links and text messages unless you, you know go. the person, you know? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even you click know what? on links that you guys send me, so whatever. <laughs> Noted. I noticed. <laughs> oh, well, you know, what, what this brings up is an excellent point. I think, it, I think we should also explain very quickly before we actually get into the, the how-to part of this, but – um, what you're what you're referring to is is basically putting all this information out there, and cyber criminals and and others, law enforcement and such, use OSINT or open source intelligence to gather information about their potential targets, right? And so the more information that people are putting out there, the easier it, it it becomes for anybody to really collect that data and really build a profile. So it's pretty amazing how freely people are posting on social media and such because they think it just goes away or it's only shared with their direct friends or whatever, but it's amazing how easily you can bypass these systems and get to get to photos and what you can pull out of those photos in terms of metadata, information about where they were taken, dates, uh, times and all that, uh, all in there, and uh, even types of devices. Um, so it, it's uh, you got to be very careful about what you're readily putting out there because Again, most people can build a complete, most people that do this for a living, whether, you know, legitimately or not, um, can build a very, very robust profile off of somebody, even people that think that think they're not using the internet very much or not involved in um, some of the stuff online, social media, and that sort of thing. There's still a lot of data out there to be collected. So anyway, segue. Um, into, you know. One of the worst things you can think is that I don't have anything worth stealing. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about, we, we started um, and, and, you know, all excellent topics, but staff training and cybersecurity awareness. Um, I mean, I'm happy to sh share our approach and kind of generally what we see, which is in a nutshell, repetition, is far more effective than doing a one long drawn out presentation once a year, right? So we're usually Hands down. Conducting. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it gets, when, when people are having to, you know, set aside an hour or two their work once a year and just kind of sit through this PowerPoint, it's just, it just does not work. But um, there are plenty of great platforms out there by, um, no before and wombat and barracuda and all these different companies are, are now have their own phishing and training platforms with good content um videos that are you know high quality they gamify the content you know they have quizzes and all that but you really need to have a security awareness training platform within um, your organization because it also makes life a lot easier as far as tracking and compliance you understand who took the uh, training, who did not, anybody that gets onboarded and added to your, you know, active directory will automatically get their training. You know, all that can be set up and automated so it keeps it much, much easier and the content is out there so you don't have to develop it yourself. Um, but with that, you also want to keep people on their toes as far as uh, doing phishing emails, test phishing emails, right? If people are You'll, you'll, you'll start to see when you're using these platforms that you have repeat offenders and certain people are more prone to clicking on phishing emails than others. And so they should get remedial training and all that. But that's the recommendation. Um, if you're still doing it the old way or not doing training at all, um, just know that it's easier to set up than you, you might think. Um, and you can have a really good program in place, customized to the audience, to the type of people in the organization, the roles, all of that. Um, and they're much more effective than they, they've ever been. Um, well, and keep in mind, it's also indefensible at this point to say, I can't afford a cyber or a cybersecurity training program. They're not expensive anymore. Yeah. We're talking, if, no, you're spending, you're spending more money filling your vending machines. I guarantee you, yeah. you know, um, you're right, Zach. And, you know, repetition is key here. And, and here's, Here's what I, I want to point out is that the, the last um, forensic investigation we did was due to a ransomware attack 
right? They, they were asking for about 3 million, kind of the same thing as, as this pipeline situation. And the way that those individuals got in was through a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, email, clickbait, clickbait, your people. Okay. They're, they're, they're humans. They're going to see something that they're like, man, I, that's a hundred dollars that I needed to buy the thing that I wanted on Amazon. Okay. And so if, if that repetition of training for those, um, for those types of emails aren't, aren't being um, driven weekly, monthly, however, on a, on a tight schedule, they're going to forget and they're going to click and, and you're going to be in the same situation that, you know, hopefully not, but um, you're going to be in a, in, a, in a very similar situation as anybody else has been in a ransom attack. Um, and, and it's not a good place to be. Um, and so that repetition that Zach's talking about is key. You have to have that security awareness training program. You have to be invested in that program and you've got to get every one of your people trained. And the cool thing about, um, as Zach was alluding to, there's these reporting platforms that come out. And so as you know, we, we use new before, okay, whatever, it doesn't matter what you use, but they all have similar capabilities, right? And so you can see that Peggy in sales or bill in sales, doesn't matter, right? Is repeatedly clicking on everything you send them. So you get like a clickers report, right? And so we can talk about the, the five people in the last campaign that we ran out of 50 people. These are the five people that tended to click on stuff and we can send them remedial training now to say, okay, look, you clicked. <laughs> We know you like to click, but let's not click so quickly, but let's kind of look at some things. So we can send them now extra training, right? To say, okay, you got the, you know, click machine goes, burr, but you need to stop with that and kind of digest the content of the email. You know, if it's too good to be true, probably is, right? So if you don't see this, just like counterfeit money, right? Or I, have to, I like to call it like fake antiques. If you ever watch Pawn Stars, right? I know you have Mike, right? Where the guys come in with like this old firearm, and he's like, "This is from the French Revolution. Oh yeah, it's worth a million dollars." And they're like, uh, "No, this is a reproduction from like 1980. It's yeah. worth two bucks, <laughs> right?" Yeah, exactly. and, right. But but those those guys um, at the Pawn Star, right? You know, the, these pawn shop owners would, if they didn't see the stuff and and converse and 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 research with experts, they would be vulnerable every time. Because technically that's a form of social engineering, right? That now the person may not be purposefully doing, maybe they truly believe that this is a French revolutionary weapon because their grandpa gave it to them or something, right? So they're, they're trusting that word. And that's what this is, is it? That's really what social engineering is, right? It's abuse of trust. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. Well, you know, you, you can implement a, good training policy, you know, and, and Peggy and Bill are clicking anyway. Uh, so, um, that you, you oh, need to give them. What, what's that? This is a family show. What Peggy and Bill do in the privacy of their home. <laughs> home. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So right, clicking on emails, man, clicking on emails. Okay. <laughs> why, why are Peggy and Bill clicking on Amazon gift card emails at work anyway? That's not, that's a <laughs> seriously. Policy. So, so speaking of which, let's talk about policies, right? I mean, that's another big thing is you have to have people understand what they are uh, supposed to be doing and not supposed to be doing in the workplace. So what right. types All of their policies, work computers? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, so being the workplace, being their, their couch at home or whatever it happens to be these days, but what types of policies would you put in place to prevent, prevent social engineering threats? That's well, the big know, question. Exact, acceptable use policy is the, the first one. Yep. Right. Acceptable use. Yeah. I echo that. Absolutely. And it's gotta be, it, it's gotta be very well, it's gotta be very concisely written. And here's the other thing is you need your, you need your humans to read it and sign it. Yeah. And, uh, one of your, one of your security training platforms will probably allow you the capability to put that policy in there as part of your security awareness. So when they're done getting their security training, they have to read the acceptable use policy and sign it before they're finished with their training, which makes it really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's amazingly how, I mean, you have to just get so granular anymore these days and you have to specifically talk about social media, especially on company owned devices. Um, and, you know, you want people to be able to feel free to, you know, if they're, especially if they're traveling and they're traveling with their laptop. Yeah. You want them to be able to go check on Facebook. Well, I personally don't, but you know, normal people probably do. Um, they, you know, 
so you want to give them that freedom to a certain extent but however you really have to define what they can and cannot do and it has to be granular and there have to be consequences um and that's one of the biggest things that i don't see you need the carrot and the stick um you know and, yeah, enforceability and, is a big deal, and and the, the policy statement should have a violations of poli- violations of this policy statement, right? If you violate this policy, you're subject to, you know, not only prosecution if you break a law, right, but you're know, going to get fired too, right? And if they don't read that and understand it, they they can't really be held. It's hard to hold them in in a court of law, right? When they're like, well, we didn't know about this. You guys didn't train us, and the attorney's going to be like, is that true? <laughs> You know, but you didn't, you didn't train them at all. Well, he, you know, and to your point, Mike, you know, it's a cultural decision, right? Some companies are, are like, oh, our people can do whatever they want on their company owned devices. And I'm like, we have companies like that. We're like, okay, okay. Let's just hope you've got really good endpoint protection and good security training. Cause something's probably going to happen if you let them do whatever they want. And then other companies will lock down web filtering so far that you can't do anything but business related websites. Right. And so it's, it's a cultural decision that the business needs to make. It's like, you want, do you, I guess you want your employees to be happy and you, you kind of inherit some risk with that, letting them, you know, be happy on the internet and do whatever they want. Um, you know, something great about that, but you also incur as a business a certain level of risk when you do that versus cutting everything off. And then you've got kind of a more cantankerous work group, but the risk is lessened. Right? <laughs> so it's, I guess one of those weird decisions that the, every business kind of has to make. Yeah, You've got other risks. Biz, yeah, employee turnover and and all that. Is staff, you know, effectiveness if they're miserable is going to decrease. So, yeah, but you need a policy, that. acceptable use policy, just like Mike said, and you need to have a security awareness and training policy, probably, mm-hmm. right? And you can put it in your data security policy. Doesn't matter where you put it, but you need to have a statement that the company. Um, acknowledges that security awareness and training is, is required to to build a, a, a strong security culture in the organization. A very wise security culture would be better. And um, you, you, you have that in a policy to basically say that you, we as a business have decided that this is important to us and we're going to train our users. And then out of that comes that acceptable use, right, that you say, okay, now these are the acceptable things that we expect with our equipment that we issue you. And you have to make that user sign to that. And then you've got to give them the training. Yeah. And the other thing that, that really will hammer that home is teach them how to do it for their home and make them understand that this is valuable, not just at work, but at home. It's good at home practices, not to click on phishing email, not to click on this stuff at home because you're a target at home as well. Hey, let's talk briefly before we wrap up here about technical implementations, right? I mean, obviously if, you know, so for example, people, maybe they can, they can't access social media on their work computers, but they can on their uh, phone that they bring to the office, right? Obviously you want to have a a separate network segmented out from everything else um, in order for them to do that. If you're going to allow them to access Facebook on their breaks or whatever, for example, what types of technical implementations would you recommend um, that will prevent these um, human mistakes from uh, allowing an attacker to get too deep into the environment. So segregation of, and so, you know, you, so not throw another policy in there, right? Bring your own device policy. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to allow users to operate their own equipment, usually phones within your corporate network, you should define that BYOD policy so that you kind of understand what risks are there and what, what actions are required by you and the user. And then you've got to have the architecture to support that type of risk, right? And so Zach was alluding to, if they're going to hook up wireless um, on their phones, you should have a guest network for them um, or a privatized corporate network that allows them to connect their mobile phones, but only only provides like internet access, right? Because those smishing attacks are going to come to the phone, right? Those, those malicious text messages, the links are going to come to the phone as well as to that computer, right? And so you, you don't want them clicking on a link while they're on your corporate Exactly. And, 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 you know, that BYOD policy has to be pretty bulletproof. And it also has to address any data. Are they allowed to access corporate confidential corporate data or anything of that nature from their phone? And if so, what happens when they leave? Is there a white policy? Do you, is the, you know, what if they leave under not so good circumstances and they're working remotely? How do you get that thing wiped? How do you get that thing dealt with? And, and um, that should all be part of your BYOD policy as well. 
a, a bidet might reach. I, anyway, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you have to make a decision, right? Do you want? And, and I think a lot of organizations will say, "Oh, it's cheaper for us if we just let users use their phone." And you know and that that may be true, but now you, you there's this whole kind of loss of centralized management and device management that you don't have now when you when you let them bring their devices because you can't. As Mike stated, right, there, maybe there's you have to let them download an app or something so you can do some remote wiping, right, capabilities, minimum, things like that. If you issue the device, you have 100% control over the device, uh, control over its configuration, control over its update, patches, security, the whole bit um, that you don't get when you allow a user to bring in their personal device. So I think that, you know, that's something, you know, like Mike said, that that BYOD policy has got to be very concise. And it's got to be very well thought out because it – the the whole idea of bringing in uncertified ar- uh, uncertified hardware into your certified architecture it you know can cause risk and you, 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 you know, as a business you need to you know first understand that and then have something in place to at least try to mitigate it a little bit and that BYD is a, a great idea for that um, a better idea is probably not allowing that type of activity if you care about inherent risk to not allow the activity at all which. I'm sure a lot of users will be mad at me for saying that. <laughs> I think it, it depends on the industry, right? Depends on the business. If you're a nuclear power plant, you're not allowing cell phones to come into sensitive areas, right? I mean, pretty sure. sure you're forward, if you're a marketing, you know, small marketing uh, firm, you know, then that's a different story. So, um, yeah. And then one of the other things that you have to add to the BYOD, which is not necessarily a social engineering thing, but as a risk thing, is we will only allow you to use devices that are, you know, still supported. You know, you can't pull out your Apple eight iPhone eight and, you know, put that on our network. You have to have a, you know, 10, 11, 12, or whatever the last three are, um, that sort of thing. So, um, that's an important key as well. And no Androids period. <laughs> oh, well, that's okay. I, I can bring my Blackberry though. Right. Cause it's have one of those. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> well, well, Hey, we are, uh, running past time here, but um, this is a interesting topic and it goes very, very deep. There's some great books on it out there. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it again in the future. Um, but the main thing is just know that social engineering is out there. People are using um, manipulation of the human element in order to be successful in attacks and it's happening every single day and criminals are successful every single day with it. So uh, we need to be aware of that. The most important thing is understand what you can do about it. And there is a lot you can do about it. Um, there's no such thing as perfect, but it can go a long way. So Mike, Laro, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Well, yeah, just keep in mind that you can go through all this and be hundred percent dead on, have everything wired tight and you're still going to, it's still going to happen at some point or another. So, yeah, but it doesn't mean yeah, don't try. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah. Well, well yeah. I, I was going to say, um, I, I, you know, a real wise man told me this once, Fuller, <coughs> Fuller. Um, what was it? Imperfect action is always better than perfect inaction. So do something, right? Do something, do something. And when you do something, if, some, if a breach does occur, if something happens, at least the chances are it will be mitigated much more quickly and a lot less damage will occur if you're doing something and being proactive. So... Get out there, be proactive, make it happen. But if you like our podcast, please hit subscribe. Let us know topics of interest and uh, reach out with any of your ideas or suggestions on what you want to hear. We will be happy to cover those. Thanks a lot and have a great day. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Ants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Rants Podcast.